Boom! No, I'm just kidding. My old instructor, Gary G, taught me that common is what you would refer to on vehicles. Good day, folks. It's DIY Guy123 here, bringing you another do it yourself video. Today, we're going to be talking all about knock sensors. Today, we're going to go through the check engine light. What is knocking? What are knock sensors? Circuit diagram showing the theory of operation, how they work to tell the ECU of a problem, failure points, impacts of a failed sensor, discussing a proper fix versus the workaround, diagnostic steps. And then I'm going to show you a workaround. If you are interested in only specific pieces of those, go to the description and search down and click on the time that is most of interest to you. First thing we're going to do, use my new X-Tool IP819 scanner. So I've turned the scanner on and I have the cable plugged into my OBD2 port underneath the dash. And I have the ignition in the on position and the check engine light is lit. So I'm going to use the scan tool to determine what's up. So I can pick auto scan and it's asking me to identify the vehicle. This is a Sierra four wheel drive. And does it have an automatic transfer case? It does. And it's climate control dual and manual. And it has the up level radio and it has 8600 GVWR. And so it's asking me what I want to diagnose. Now I can do an automatic scan and it will scan all of the modules in this vehicle. And it will, it's pretty cool. You see my other videos on this tool that shows you various modules. But today, I know I only want to look at what's causing the check engine light to come on. So I'm going to tell it which system I'm interested in. These are all the various modules that it sees. And so I'm going to pick powertrain because that's the one that causes the check engine light to come on. And I've got, uh, I can read a trouble code, um, get rid of what we're trying to look at. So I'm going to diagnose. And here we are. It shows P0332 knock sensor 2 circuit low frequency the last test it ran it failed this ignition test since i've turned the key on it has not run the test and i've cleared it in the past and it's failed again this is a recurring problem these tests by the engine's computer they don't run as soon as you turn the key on or they often don't run as soon as you turn the key on you may need to drive it on the highway for a period of time now it might fail right away or certain types of tests you may need to drive it on the highway after the engines got, come up to a certain temperature, the coolant's up to a certain temperature. You're going at a consistent speed with the throttle, like very consistent. You're not, you know, changing the throttle position drastically for a certain period of time. Then it will run the test. If you clear the code, start the engine, and the code does not come immediately back on, it doesn't mean you fix the problem. Pre-ignition is when the fuel combusts earlier than it's supposed to due to compression. And that is a problem that's often mixed with knocking. What is knocking? If you picture this as the combustion chamber and the spark plug is at the top, as the spark is causing, or the flame and the explosion is moving downward, the explosion can actually be triggered somewhere else in the cylinder. And when those two explosions meet each other, it will cause a knock or a ping. And if you've ever driven a car that has knocking, it's, it's pretty easy to feel that the engine will shudder, you'll feel a lack of power, there will be a loss of fuel economy. Usually it only knocks during heavy acceleration. When it knocks like that, apparently the emissions are much worse for a vehicle as well. These knock sensors, their purpose is to detect that. And when they detect knocking and pre-ignition, they will adjust the timing of the engine for the ignition timing for uh, optimum fuel economy, power, and to prevent knocking. How do they do it? Well, the knock sensors, the, the GM V8s of this vintage, mine's a 2006, and I think they go, I don't know when that engine started, but it goes all the way up to 2007 at least. Those GM V8s, they have two knock sensors, one in the, the sort of the front of the engine, one in the back of the engine, and they're basically microphones. They're tuned to pick up the sounds or the vibrations of knocking. So they, they probably aren't gonna pick up anything for my voice talking, but whatever the sounds and the pulses are related to knocking, that's what they're specialized for picking up. They are a high resistance device, high resistance electronic device. And when they hear a knock, they generate a little voltage over that high resistance. Okay, so here's some really high level theory of operation. And I'm gonna talk about the battery, the computer, the engine, 
and the knock sensors. And so let's start over here in the battery. And this discussion is all going to revolve around voltage and reference voltage specifically. So if we start at the common point, my old instructor, Gary G, taught me that common is what you would refer to on vehicles. You don't talk about ground. There's no such thing as a ground on a vehicle. And common is the zero volt reference that we assume to be the fenders, the chassis, the uh, frame, all that sort of thing. Zero volt reference at common. And then if you, after you connect a 12 volt battery on the positive terminal of the 12 volt battery, you have 12 volts and that wiring is connected to the ECU. So the ECU has a concept of 12 volts. And then that 12 volts is also connected to lights and radios and all the other appliances in your vehicle that need 12 volts. That's the last we're gonna talk about 12 volts. Next, the ECU also has a connection to common either through a connection to the firewall or it actually may have wires that go directly back to through the wiring harness to the negative terminal of the battery. Uh, the ECU may have many common connections and they all need to work properly. Uh, that's because there could be isolated circuits in the ECU that do different functions and they all need an isolated common. So that's the ECU. So the ECU understands what zero volts is and it understands what 12 volts is. Okay, the next thing that we'll be looking at is over here we have the engine. And we have the cylinder block, which is connected to the common, basically the chassis. It could be a, a ground strap that goes from the block to the firewall and to the negative terminal of the battery directly. So the block is at zero volts reference. So is the head that's bolted to the block. And then we have the, se the sensors. We have bank one, one bank two, and there, one of them is in the front of the head and one of them is in the back of the head. These sensors are threaded. They, they look like a, you might say a little bolt at the end and the, the head has a hole and it's threaded and the sensor just screws in gently, screws in with not a lot of torque into the head. And the other side of the sensor connects to the wire harness, which goes to the ECU. And you have two wires that go to the ECU for the two sensors. Normally there'd be no voltage generated by these sensors, but when the knocking is detected by either of the sensors, they generate a very small voltage over their high resistance. That voltage is seen by the ECU. Now, I, I, I'm not, I don't know what the voltage is. I'm sure it's not as high as 12 volts. It's probably a very small voltage, millivolts probably, something like that, and the ECU reads it. Now, because it's a millivolt signal or a low, low voltage signal, the impedance in the ECU must be high in order to not draw that voltage down. And that'll become uh, interesting in a moment. Now, common failure points for these sensors are where they the way the design is and they screw into the head it's a valley in the head and water will kind of collect in there condensation maybe you drove through a big puddle splash for a variety of reasons moisture can get in there and when it gets there it doesn't run away it'll run down into this valley where the sensors are located and it stays there and it can cause corrosion between those threads of the sensor and the threads in the head now corrosion generally will cause an increase in resistance so if you had a corrosion problem between the threads, you will see an increased resistance between here and there. However, in extreme cases, when corrosion grows from the threads up and around the side of the sensor and connects to the wiring, maybe through a break in the insulation of the wiring, you could actually see a decreased resistance from here to here. That's I, I've not seen that myself. I don't have a lot of experience diagnosing these, but I would believe corrosion could cause either of those problems. But in general, the main problem would be corrosion causing an increased resistance here. Now, when you get an increase in resistance between the sensor and the head, that causes the voltage seen by the ECU to be even lower due to voltage divider theory. And so if the corrosion is significant enough, that voltage is too small and the ECU will throw a code that says, hey, I can't, uh, I can't hear the, I can't hear the, uh, the, the signal that's generated by the sensor. Now, the way the ECU would do that is it would measure the resistance here, or in other words, it would apply a voltage and see um, if the voltage is drawn down by the sensor. And if it's not drawn down by the sensor enough, the ECU would say, hey, there's an open circuit or too high in a resistance. If the voltage is applied here and the sensor, um, voltage is, or sorry, the voltage is drawn down too low, then the computer would say that this sensor has a resistance that's too low and would set a, a fault there as well. And so in my case, I was seeing P0332-BF, that's knock sensor two circuit, low input. 
uh, low input, input to the ECU. That suggests to me that what that this sensor right here has a has a problem with corrosion. The other problem that you can experience is the actual sensor internals will fail. They can fail open circuit or short circuit, and I've I've heard of it happening both ways. Other things that can cause sensor failure, an EGR system problem can cause this. You can have bad wiring and you can have a bad temperature sense. Well, first thing we're gonna do is take this cover off here and there's a single eight millimeter bolt head. Your eight millimeter socket. And you very quickly can get access to that connector right there. You can see this wiring harness comes here and out of there comes this connector right here. Basically, I'm just pulling that tab back gently and popping that out. Oh dear, what a job that would be to change. Oh, yuck. This goes to the, to the actual sensors and this must go to the ECU. People talk about that wire harness dam being damaged. You know, that very often is a problem that I've heard reported. So if you're gonna take this all apart and change the sensors, you definitely want to change that wire harness as well, right up to here. Right on, okay. So, you probably couldn't see that, but basically I reached in behind this bracket with my pick and I just pulled off that metal tab right there and it just slid out of the way. So now I've got some better access to this connector. So which one is the problem one? Well, in there there's like a dark blue and a light blue kit, uh, wire and I don't know which one is the faulty one so what I'm going to end up doing is measuring from each of these pins to the negative terminal battery and checking the resistance. Okay, so what I have is a lead clamped onto the negative terminal of battery and it is clamped onto the lead that goes into the ohm meter. Pay no attention that it's a red lead, that's irrelevant. We're measuring resistance and you're going from the negative terminal of battery here. The polarity doesn't matter. Then I have a black lead coming out of the meter that goes to one of the sensor connectors there. This one is the darker blue connector and I get 96.8 kilo ohms. I'm on my 200 kilo ohm range. So I'm measuring the resistance from the light blue wire to the negative terminal of battery and I'm getting seven kilo ohms. Not good. We're looking for between 90 and 110 kilo ohms. Okay, so after we've identified which is the faulty sensor, we want to remove it from the whole picture here. So to do that, you cut the wire for the bad sensor, taking it out of the picture, and then the wire, that wire that you cut, the lead that comes from the ECU, you want to bridge it on and solder it to the other wire that's a good wire. Given the impedances of these sensors and of the ECU, there is not likely to be any significant impact and certainly when the computer detects a faulty sensor it is ignoring any input from that sensor so when we cut it out of the circuit it's not going that will not have any negative impact you're doing this at your own risk the the system was not designed to be configured this way and so you uh, need to decide if this is something you want to do i did it no ill effects for me i'm quite happy i did and my check engine light uh, will be resolved this way so what i'm going to do is snip the light blue wire right about here, and I will connect it to the dark blue wire. Getting that out of the way. So I'd said the light blue one was the faulty one. Cut this bad boy right here. Peel back gets insulation enough to solder to it. So I got a little bit of copper exposed there. I want to, I want to cut into the dark blue wire. Expose the copper there. Okay, now I'm gonna blob a little bit of solder on that and then tape the whole thing up and then put it back together. I'm mostly satisfied with that. Okay, so I managed to get some good tape wraps on that. I taped up the wire that had been cut and is just free. So I'll check the bottom wire. This is the dark blue one. And I'm getting 98 kilo ohms. And I'll check the other wire. And I'm getting 98 kilo ohms as well. I put a little dielectric grease in the female end of the factory wire harness. Put those guys together and see this little clip right here? I'm going to slide it back on its bracket. 
And that's all there is to it. And of course, I've reinstalled this cover. Let's go and start this thing up and see what happens. You have two options. You can clear the code and see if it comes back, or you can leave the code and eventually it will, the computer will recheck it and if the problem is gone, it will clear the code. I'm gonna wipe them out and see if they come back. Diagnostic trouble codes, no trouble code found. So let's start this up and see what happens. Boom! No, I'm just kidding. Sounds the way it normally does. No check engine light, but as mentioned, we're gonna let this go for uh, you know a few trips on the highway before we call it good. And I'll note the mileage here, we've got 123,085 kilometers. Okay, so this vehicle's been driven around for a little bit this afternoon, and we now have 123,131 kilometers on it. About two thirds of that was highway driving at about uh, 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour in that range. And during that time, the test would have certainly run. And so the fact that the check engine light has not come back on is a great sign that the repair was, that the workaround was successful. So here we are in the dark. That's the end of this video. Good luck with your do-it-yourself projects. If you like my videos, please subscribe. The end.